Welcome to the Dr. Digipole Show. I'm Alan Rosenblatt, a.k.a. Dr. Digipole, and we are here for another hour of talking about the intersection of dig digital media and politics. We've got a good show for you, signed, uh, ready to go for you here today. Uh, my guest today is going to be Kevin Bow. Ke uh, Kevin is a uh, communication strategist, but also has been around the digital media space for a long time and started back in the days of uh, cable broadcasting back in 1983 when he was doing, uh, basically pioneering the use of geo-targeted um, ads for um, political candidates. And uh, over the course of the next 25 or so years, Kevin, there is Kevin, Kevin basically was a, had a front row seat to the transition of the industry from analog to digital. And, uh, and more recently, Kevin has become a documentary film producer. And so he's here to talk to us about what he's seen along the way in this road from digital analog to digital and some uh, some of the insights that he's put into his uh, new documentary, um, uh, Democracy Through the Looking Glass. So welcome, Kevin. Hey, Alan. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm great. I'm great. And it's always good to hear another Boston accent here. Um, you know, we'll get Ken later on. Yep. I'm a big fan of that, you know. I, I'm from Boston, but somehow I don't have the accent. I just I don't know how that happened. But uh, that's, that's about that, right? Um, so tell me, Kevin, um, take a moment and just tell us a little bit about who you are, where you came from in this space in order to get to the point of becoming a documentarian. Sure. Well, um, you know, like any kid out of college, and unfortunately for, fortunately for me, it was 1983, uh, you want to get involved in, you know, whatever the cutting edge was. Um, and back then it was cable TV. Back then it was uh, selling 30-second TV ads on a CNN or an ESPN in small towns. I, I was in Weymouth, Massachusetts that had about a 10,000 home cable system. So, you know, going to local businesses selling uh, $10, 30-second spots. You know, people thought I was the man on the moon back in um, 83, 84, and, you know, uh, always had a passion for politics. So always had that um, to play and, um, you know, sought out political advertising even in 1984 for a state representative. And, um, you know, I, I, in an early industry, I was the third person for what is now the Comcast New, New, uh, New England uh, ad sales team. Uh, I was the third person, uh, third salesperson under uh, Continental Cable Vision. So they were a pretty big operator in Boston, and in the late 80s, um, I, you know, told my bosses there's some money to be made, and, and uh, they were skeptical. Of course, you know, the cable people back then were more uh, pole climbers, telephone pole climbers, as opposed to running an ABC or something like that. Um, right. And uh, we engaged, I don't know whether it was 88 or 89, we uh, probably engaged in what is most likely the first political seminar um on cable advertising in the boston state house you know uh you, you call it geo fencing you know we, we got the fancy words today you know back then it was just common sense targeting into a town because that's where a cable system is and having four or five you know obvious demographic networks like a, a cnn versus an espn versus an mtv so um you know now of course we we dress it all up um so you know i was having fun doing that um the two years after that, we, I participated in uh, the first uh, Washington, D.C.-based uh, seminar for time buyers and, and candidates and consultants on how to execute, you know, cable buys. And, of course, back then, uh, it was all about buying broadcast tonnage. Uh, if you were a congressional race, you, you know, you either lived in a, you were in a small market, rural market, and you could buy uh, TV cheap and, and you use broadcast. But if you were near any kind of uh, metropolitan area, you wouldn't be, you'd have to run a, you know, $30 million uh, uh, TV campaign to run for Congress. So slowly but surely, uh, you know, I, I, I was in the pioneering, pioneering days and uh, I left the cable advertising space uh, before it became, uh, you know, just part of the buy, an automatic part of the buy. Um, but, right. um, you know, certainly uh, from there, you know, in terms of my transition in digital, um, 
I had the unique experience working the Continental of, of witnessing the pilot, which was at the time the pilot that turned analog tapes into digital spot delivery, uh, which just transformed everything because prior to that, you only could get copy changes or spot changes once a week. Uh, you literally had to dub, you know, for a CNN, you had to dub eight three quarter inch tapes per week. And, you know, if you were uh, inserting in 30 or 40 different uh, cable networks and 30 or 40 different cable systems, you know, you do some math and you literally were going out the door every week with two or 300, um, you know, three quarter inch tapes. And so you were the, driving them to the, to deliver in person. You, you were driving them to the cable head ends, which oftentimes was, you know, right next to the water tower on the hill. <laughs> you know, quite, quite literally. Uh, and yeah, so you, you would have uh, delivery services that would literally have, you know, 10 or 12 big, you know, huge containers uh, going off to, you know, different parts of the state or different parts of New England. And, you know, overnight, relatively speaking, that went away with just sending it through T1 lines. Uh, right. the, the first test I saw was a JPEG analog JPEG and of course it blew me away but the, the tech guy was saying oh no you know MPEG's right around the corner and of course it was just Greek to me. Now the interesting thing was is that was with digital computer uh, deck, uh, digital equipment company and of course at the time that was a huge mini company, a mini computer right. uh, company just you know dominated uh, uh, the high tech scene in, in the 80s and uh, they were on their last legs and this for, what they figured to be like a $40 million business um, was just too small for them to even, you know, put on the ledger sheet. So they spun it off. Uh, I don't know what the, quite the deal was, but Sea Change International is, is now, you know, a kind of a big player in the digital space. And that, that is um, where that company came from in terms of, yeah, so, you know, delivering all the um, digit, video through digital just, you know, transformed things to have like daily spot changes to have better targeting, uh, not just into clumps of cable systems, but, you know, even within um, uh, uh, nodes, excuse me, yeah, nodes of, of the different uh, cable groups. At that point, I had left, you know, the selling of it, and I was more, I started a software company that was more dealing with the back end of, of figuring out, you know, the proposals and, and sending this information in, because remember, think about it. You are when you buy, you know, a spot on CNN in a, in a uh, given uh, metro market. You're literally buying probably CNN into ten or twelve different cable configurations. That, from a billing purpose or from a time buyer purpose, it's one spot. But from a technical purpose and from a billing purpose and, and money, it's many many spots. So that translation between the easy uh, side for the time buyer. And the complicated side of the of the um, business side, uh, that I was involved in, in uh, you know, kind of straighten up that that side for a while. Um, you know, I guess like everybody, we you know go through different phases of life. And by about 2014, I was you know done with the trade shows and done with the conventions and done with done with it all. Um, and I, you know, picked up a few old passions. I mean, the irony of getting into cable advertising as a 21 year old is I wanted to get into cable production field. You know, I wanted to run one of those um, uh, local origination channels. And by the time a job came around, hey, I was in ad sales. I was making some money, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that went Hard on the way. Hard to break from that. Yeah, right. yeah. And, but, you know, at, at, at 2004, you know, a different lifestyle, you know, do strategic, strategic communications, but more for small businesses, more for nonprofits, uh, government agencies. And, uh, you know, I um, picked up the video camera again. And uh, not again, I picked it up really for the first time. And, you know, to taste technology, you know, got myself a nice laptop and learned Final Cut at the Apple stores. And I get more for the clients and knowing that, you know, video was going on the web, et cetera. Um, I just figured being able to do a three or four minute video uh, as an as a extra service for clients and would, would make me more marketable. Now, you know, the good news is, is yes, it's, the bad news is when you go on Craigslist, you see the $15 an hour video producers, but hey, what are you going to do? And so <laughs> the, the um, you know, just moving along, um, I live next to the New Hampshire border. I um, 
love politics. And when I had an, you know, kind of an opportunity to like put aside some things, I just took my video camera and uh, followed the New Hampshire primary for nine months. Um, you know, more to, you know, kind of, well, ha have a little fun, but also more to stretch my video making, um, you know, right. in terms of volume and storytelling and challenge myself. So during that nine months, I made 85 different videos uh, that were topical uh, on the ground 2016, if anyone's interested in that. Um, and, you know, I, I began to develop a view that was, or an eye that was certainly different from what you'd see on TV. You know, remarkably challenging uh, to the point of really why bother of trying to come up with um, a new angle of how to cover politics or how to cover the that daily process and 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 what have you. I mean, you had 50 reporters at any given event, so um, I knew I wasn't going to be you know a breaking news uh, person. I knew I wasn't going to get some big scoop. Uh, so I always was trying to take that big big view and. Um, after nine months, I had a chance to, you know, go home and kind of process what I experienced. And uh, it may not surprise you that, you know, one of the least covered parts of a campaign is the press themselves. So, you know, it was a fairly easy target for me to, uh, uh, you know, analyze my nine months hanging out with the press. And, and essentially, that's what it is. Uh, it is of course, it's, you know, it's, it's set in 2016, but it really is not so much about the 2016 election because, you know, there's 500,000 people covering that right now. Um, right. I try to make a movie that was more about, you know, how to think of, you know, set up for 2020, you know, what's right about democracy, what's wrong about democracy, um, and hopefully take a, a bigger picture of, of um, you know, the, the pluses and minuses and not worry about the the, you know, daily, you know, in, in and out of the process. So I, there, there's an overview for it. So kind of like the, a Boys in the Bus kind of remake on video from way back in the 72 campaign. Yeah, uh, more, more just a kind of a firsthand account of a guy that liked politics and had a, and had a video camera and some time to burn. Um, right. And, you know, being in New Hampshire particularly, not to talk about, you know, should it be the first and does it have an impact? The, the experience of being so close to these candidates and getting you know, the kind of access to these candidates that you just cannot get. So just as a, you know, a video blogger like myself, um, I had you know, enormous interactions. Um, and and it, I think it gives a viewer a real appreciation of what you, know, what you don't see nowadays in American elections. You know, we've got this, you know, industrial process uh, that, you know, really does separate, you know, the candidate from the people. But you don't have that in Iowa and you don't have that in New Hampshire. So uh, that's so, so typically the, the press plays this intermediary role between the, the voters and the candidate. And in Iowa and New Hampshire in the early primaries, that buffer is is it removed and there's a direct connection but the, the press is still there yeah i would I, I don't want to completely say it's a virgin experience <laughs> right right <laughs> you know. so so what is their role in that modified uh scenario well again it depends on the time but certainly the, the week prior to the primary or two weeks before the primary it is the media show it is you know the filtered uh experience um Earlier than that, you are a fly on the wall. Uh, well, you, it's a twofold. Uh, you are you're a fly on the wall. You can watch these conversations between you know candidates and in the and the people. I mean, not not just the question and answers at the town hall, but you know when they go to a picnic or after the town hall and they'll hang out for 20 minutes and talk to the voters. You get to capture all that, and you get to hear right. you know the questions, the concerns, and and you do get absolutely uh, a, a different perspective on the candidates. At the same time, uh, the press has got a whole lot more access. They'll give you, you know, more um, press, press gaggles and, and what have you. And you might, at some time, you might only have three or four reporters. So you can get a lot more intimate, uh, intimate as opposed to, you know, like the week before, uh, forget about it. You might as well be, uh, you know, it, it's, it's game time. The, right. The, the, yeah. 
So let me ask you, um, a lot of some of the themes that you touched upon, that you're touching upon in the in the movie, uh, have to do with the role of social media and politics. And it's yeah. a topic that I care a lot about. I want to start with a specific question, and then you can wax on other things as well. But what did you see in terms of how the reporters integrated social media into their routines? You know, it's funny. It, it took me a little bit for that to sink in because um, the, you know, the, the, the cell phone is so ubiquitous nowadays. It's not just in, in a media board. So if you're out at the mall, if you're anywhere, everyone's got their cell phone, everyone's, you know, tweeting and this and that. So I didn't think twice about all the mobile devices and all the, the time that, you know, the embeds and, and the local reporters spent, um, you know, on their mobile. And then of course it hit me, you know, when I read the, you know, Twitter feeds, you know, after the event, uh, you know, that they've got to be on all the time. They've got to be, right. you know, doing their notes for their main story. They've got to be, you know, promoting the, uh, you know, the event or what they're at. Uh, at. So, I mean, absolutely. I, you know, it, it, whether it's a form of journalism or not, I don't know. I, I kind of, I saw it as a form of promotion, uh, both for them, the reporter and, and their um, media. So they're simultaneously producing the content and marketing the content. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's how they're generally, well, I'm sure they're seeing Twitter on a few different levels, but uh, those Twitter feeds are definitely designed to promote uh, their outlets and themselves as a report. Well, I can certainly uh, um, commiserate because uh, you might have noticed that when you first started talking, I was looking away from the camera. I was over on Facebook over here on my other monitor, um, posting it on, uh, posting the live feed onto uh, the, the show page and then sharing it to my personal Facebook profile and then tweeting it on my Twitter account so that people would know that we were live and could click through and watch us. Right, and, right, uh, right. you know, there's, there's that element of it. What sense did you get from the reporters about how they felt about having to do all this stuff? Um, you know, I didn't probe that much. Um, I, I, you know, I got the sense, well, I got the sense that none of them, uh, many of them didn't think twice about it because they might have been of the age or the generation that that's what you do. Um, you know, and then, you know, maybe it's my own, uh, bias limitations that, um, you know, I wasn't as uh, in tune to, uh, to that side of it. Well, it is interesting because a few weeks ago we had Paul Singer from USA Today on the show, and he predicted, in part, to a large degree, because of all the extra demands that social media and digital media place on journalists, that he thinks a lot of those political reporters that you saw up in New Hampshire are going to quit at the end of the election. Now, of course, you saw them at the beginning, right? Oh, before yeah. they got burned out, and he's talking about them, you know. You know, he was talking about them a month before the, the general election. Well, so well, it's a year and a half apart. I, I don't doubt that. Uh, I don't think it has to do with the fact that they're burned out from, um, you know, having to multitask in terms of Twitter and, and, and producing a story. I mean, I, I, I think, speaking for myself, there's, you know, you're wasting your time at many of these events. Uh, you're, you're locked in a pen. You're, you know, you're not getting, you know, certainly now, you're not getting any access. So, um, you know, I would commiserate with some of the frustrations with the folks about only having a three question press gag and that the, and that the candidate would, uh, you know, filibuster, you know, each question, you know? So <laughs> th there was enough frustration, you know, just in New Hampshire. I couldn't imagine the, the, the frustration of trying to, you know, cover one of these events. I mean, you know, Hillary Clinton was always with Secret Service protection, and so she was always um, uh, off limits, relatively speaking. And you know, even you know, Trump obviously is, uh, you know, he he's in the in the uh, in the cave right now. So, you know, maybe Ken will speak to it later. But uh, how do you have any fun? I mean, people, go, oh, it's wonderful. He's there on the campaign trail, this and that. It it's just a horrible human condition. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> it's not to sound um, optimistic. 
Well, so let's let's transition. Let's talk a little bit about your thoughts about the general impact of social and digital media is having on politics at large. Well, you know, just that multitasking that you were talking about yourself and the multitasking of the reporters. I mean, uh, and, and you know, how do the reporters uh, keep all the balls in the air? Well, you know, we got to be worrying about uh, we the people and and the and the effect of all of us. And you know, a little clicheish and Marshall McLuhan is if, if you know the medium is the message. Uh, if we interpret um, um, perceptions or what have you based on the quality of the media that you're getting or the, the, the subtle content, what is the uh, message of the digital age? I mean. We multitask. We we you know we have short things for short attention spans. It's it, there's there's so much stimulus going at us that we've got to like over amplify things. You know, clickbait. Um, um, you know, headlines and 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 you know we got to make it brief. So you know if you had something really serious to talk about, you're out of luck. So <coughs> you know, in the biggest picture, I think that's creating a layer on you know the body politic you know the people the, the the media themselves and and you know a kind of a future shock if i might get into some cliches um right. and uh, <coughs> you know i i think it's increasing a level of social anxiety that we you know normally wouldn't have i mean we might be outraged at something out of five but with the way we're getting the information and the way we're expected to react right away without any kind of reflection, you know, uh, I think it's, you know, making a five, you know, a six or a seven. And I think, I think the way we go about things is absolutely, you know, contributing to um, the negativeness of, of our political environment. Yeah. Well, I can you think of any, okay, go ahead, finish well, your point. I, I do have to confess, you know, on my movie, uh, it, it's a work in progress. I get 70 minutes, it'll be done in January. And I, I always knew that I needed to do a final, you know, tweaking um, um, closer to the election. And it's not about this election. It doesn't matter who, who, who wins. And I always assumed it was going to be very, very negative. Um, but I, you know, like everybody, <laughs> got a little blown away last night, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, so a few people have said, dial down, you know, in terms of my finish, uh, dial down my digital big picture I just gave. Uh, so I, you know, some of that might be in there. I might be dialing it down. I just want to give you a, a warning that if you look at the final piece and you're saying, "Hey, where, where was the uh, future shock stuff?" We're, right. we're still wrestling with my final ending because you know Trump just keeps. I mean, if my movie is about democracy, you know, we were just assaulted last night. Yeah, tell me more. What do you, what, what, what's driving that comment? Is it just the? Uh... Well, I'll wait and see about accepting well, it, the results comment, well, or it, is there it, more? It, it first off, it ties into, you know, the basic premise about digital and about the fragmentation and about the ability uh, to, for anybody with some resources, whether it's an interest group or a billionaire, to create their own, you know, media platform, their own message platform. And, and to, fra you know, everything's so fragmented that, where we're you know no longer you know joined by three networks we no longer have walter cronkite bringing us to the middle and we've got you know 350 uh people pulling us in every which way direction i mean come on glenn beck you know opposing donald trump where, where does that fit in the political spectrum you know i mean it's like, it's like <laughs> this this freaking tiny you know what i mean and um so you know back to trump and and, and well Back to this, uh, my, one of my main theses is the, the press has kind of uh, given up and is unable to really cover politics in a serious way or really cover democracy in a serious way. Uh, that is the main thrust of, of my movie. And I, and I've Why? Got on that. Why are they unable? Is, their, is it the reporter's fault? Well, is, so, it, uh, is it the lack of funding? Well, obviously, the biggest thing I think is the you know the new media environment. You know, newspapers don't have the resources. The other folks, unless you're the cable news networks, the other folks are still you know um, losing money, breaking even, et cetera. So, uh, you know, part of it's that. Part of it, I think, is you know what we have from the old media guard or the old style of journalism is the process, the the horse race, 
and you know started with the great Teddy White, got the inside scoop on how to run, you know, how to win the presidency in 1960. It was replicated and replicated and replicated. 60 years later, it is just a tired, dead mule. And and you know, it's it's time we you know stop doing that. The other thing on top of that is the you know the need in 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 this environment, this media environment to go after the shiny objects, to, to produce the content that's shareable, that people comment on, et cetera. So, I mean, like I said, that's all the shiny objects. So I think a, you know, a bad uh, combination of the old media style of still covering the process, combined with this new need to, to do the shiny object, uh, has has really left us devoid of you know any meaningful kind of news commentary, et cetera. I mean, you wouldn't you know twenty David Broders on the ground in New Hampshire would not have let <laughs> Donald Trump get away with this. I mean, that's you know right. So there was only one David Broder. I'll give you that. So part, I mean, it sounds like part of this is that you know with restricted financial resources in the media outlets. They have let go a lot of senior grizzled um, press veterans. There's a lot of younger press uh, press out there who, you know, maybe have you know smart and have a bright future in front of them, but don't have the seasoning and the and the the experience to be able to step up and really push the issue. Or maybe they don't have the experience to be able to see the sidestepping of the candidates, and so they're just not polished enough they're not seasoned enough to be able to 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 deal yeah I, I didn't go there uh and i didn't necessarily you know see that per se but you know i saw well the, some of the local reporters were grizzly veterans etc cetera, etc cetera. Right. i saw a lot of smart you know sharp people and did i you know did, did i ever have deep conversations with them no so, you know, it's, I was either like, you know, trying to stand, get my camera, you know, fight for space on the, on the riser or something like that. But they, right. they were, you know, what I see is more what their editors wanted them to get, what they were told to do, and that's what they did. I mean, the, the, the um, embeds, network embeds, I mean, they were just told to follow the candidates around. And, and of course, they, they, they worked them like dogs, you know. So, you know, I'm very sympathetic. I guess the bottom line is I'm very sympathetic to the actual reporters on the ground and right. uh, you know just knew them to be smart and, and just just doing their job but if i get back get back to trump, trump though for a second about where this all ties in and what happened last night you know the 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 void that the media has created about you know giving this some serious coverage as opposed to the process and, and the shiny objects obviously is the vacuum's got to be filled and the vacuums have been filled by the uh Three Barts and the and the and the Trumps and the and the Daily Coasts and the the Young Turks, et cetera, et cetera, and and you know it gives everybody their own little you know ecosystem uh, where they have the echo chamber to keep you know keep uh, um, becoming believers, and so Trump now is operating in that environment, and right. and the worst possibilities of Donald Trump, which is a psycho uh, a, a, a narcissist. Psych a psychopathic narcissist, excuse me. And that was pretty obvious from the very beginning. And, you know, what we saw last night was, you know, hopefully the peak of that narcissism. And, you know, he doesn't, you know, we knew he didn't care about, uh, you know, a lot of people. At the end of the day, he doesn't care about democracy. I mean, I, I, do I overstate that at all? I don't think so. Well, I don't know. That's interesting. I mean, that's that's certainly the reaction I got. But I can see from his comment that he's coming at it from the perspective of if I feel that the election doesn't reflect the will of the people, mm -hmm. then it's a problem. And so, in his mind, it's about democracy. But as I've no, as I observed again today after the uh, after this debate. And just as I saw after the other debates, when you look at Trump's understanding of the will of the people, you can see it on what he shares on his Twitter account 
and what polls he talks about. He shares all of the self-selected sample polls that are on all the conservative websites that predominantly conservative people read, and they volunteer to give their answers to the survey as opposed to having a random or probability sample chosen by the researchers through a methodologically rigorous process and then going out to get those answers in order to get a sample that can be used to estimate to the population. And he continually refocuses on these polls that don't do that and presents it as if it is actual representation of public opinion. Now, maybe he does understand that it's garbage, that he doesn't care because it serves his message purposes. But sometimes I wonder, you know, listening to his questions about, you know, well, you have problems with, with, with women voters, Mr. Trump. Well, I did really well with women voters in the Republican primary. Yeah, but this is general election, Mr. Trump. I don't think he gets that transition that it's a bigger audience now. What, what the guy that respects women, you know, that he keeps repeat, repeating himself? Listen, More than I, anybody. I, I might have <laughs> misrepresented myself. I am, in fact, a big defender of Donald Trump by reason of insanity. <laughs> All right, all right. If you're asking me, you know, I, I just, you know, if, if I might take a jab at the talking heads trying to figure out Donald's strategy and how he's good at this and he's good at that, I will admit he's good at a lot of, you know, verbal dances. And, and if I ever had a one on one extended conversation, I think he'd tie me up in knots. But, you know, the man uh, is, is clearly deluded in terms of. You know what is reality or not? This is he's so self-focused. There's nothing, there's nothing uh, more important than feeding his ego. And, and you know, back to you, back to your, your polls. If if he had none of those unscientific online polls that he could you know clutch to, he'd fund one. He'd find one. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, he would buy one. He would fund it. Right, right, right. I mean, it blew my mind the other day that I, I saw him at a rally where he was telling the audience, don't watch the mainstream media, don't watch the media outlets, go to social media, go to these websites that are providing you information that's different because you can't trust the mainstream media. But he's driving people to unverified, un, um, unsourced information that is so consistently wrong. And Alan... We only have to blame, well, you know, ourselves at the end, but we really have to blame the press themselves because the press, the, you know, the Press Institute uh, had a survey last spring or, or about 6% of the American public have a, a great deg degree of confidence in the media and their information sources. And what I saw firsthand and, and have documented is would completely back that up, okay? Hands down, they're not what I saw is not qualified uh, for you know covering a presidential campaign. All right, so they have you know given up, acquiesced any kind of serious political discussion, and in that vacuum has come all of this stuff that you're referring to. So yeah, you know, I think you 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 put it very interestingly before that their editors are telling the journalists to follow the candidate as opposed to, I think, if you think back to the days of, say, Woodward and Bernstein, they followed the story, yeah. not the candidate. I, and, I mean, well, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, the, the, the typical campaign events, even in New Hampshire, are, you know, essentially a co-production of the campaign and in, in, in the, in the um, candidate, excuse me, the campaign and the press. I mean, not in a nefarious way, but they both have their, you know, similar interests that this campaign, this, this event goes off, uh, you know, well. The media needed a six o'clock report or, or, you know, they needed footage for the next morning news or something like that. And obviously the campaign, um, you know, wants a nice event with their campaign or the candidate looks good. And it, it, it's these little things that, um, you know, just... Make the, the 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 ability to I think you know, be objective and be aggressive. I mean, I think I think that's what we're talking about. It's like you know, uh, uh, the the uh, in Ken, I don't know if you you're, you would weigh in there. You know, did the reporters 
ask questions differently? Where the where the editor looking for different stories? I don't know, but it just seems as if we're we're not on the the, the serious track here. So let's take a switch gears. Uh, tell us about when the movie comes out and where people can see it. Sure. Well, you know, I first started uh, the, uh, as a as a passion project, and I just wanted to finish it before I deal with any business uh, side of it, because you know I'm a business guy. Why do I want to deal with that? So I have uh, some early submissions into Sundance and, and a couple of other ones. I don't expect to get selected, uh, but that's the end of January. Um, I, you know, I I will this will be done in January. I'm working on my music and and. Uh, you know, just working on, on the ending. It, it will be, it's, it, I might go the um, festival route. And depending on how that goes in terms of exposure, um, I, I might immediately jump into iTunes and me, immediately right. jump into like a video on demand, things like that. Um, it's, you know, it, back to the whole analog digital world. Um, you know, the, the good news is, is that it really has opened up, you know, access to people like myself. And I have been able to shoot, edit, et cetera. I can, I can get this distributed to iTunes. I can get this distributed to potentially VOD platforms. Uh, you know, so, or I could go the traditional route. And, and so uh, this is a learning process for me. And uh, so you'll find out in January where you can. Where you well, can. let me just tell you that um, in addition to Ken, we also have Ben Barnett uh, here, who's one of our regular uh, analyst pundits in the uh, trending in politics and among his hats uh, ben owns the philadelphia independent film festival uh -huh. so aha uh -huh. so ben is here um you'll, you'll we'll bring him up on the screen momentarily and uh but we'll make sure that you two talk to each other because uh i'm sure he'd love to get a get a crack at uh, at seeing what you have what you have to offer um sure. so with that let me uh thank you very much kevin for sharing uh I appreciate it. And if you want to stick around for the uh, trending in politics discussion, um, all you need to do is stick, stay, stay here. Um, I'll take you off cram. But if you have a question or comment you want to add, just uh, raise your hand, and I'll see that you've got it, and I'll put you back on screen to talk. Terrific. Thank you again, Alan. Great talk. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming to join us. So uh, let's uh, switch over to our trending in politics uh, uh, segment. I'm going to start by bringing. Ben up on screen because I do want to get his sense because Ben is, uh, as I mentioned, Ben, welcome. Um, ben is a, uh, oh, speak up, I, oh, I hit, go on you. can you talk, Ben, can I hear you? Uh, I can't hear you. Nope, I can't hear you, Ben. You try taking out your headphones. I know you made you, I made you get those. Can you Are you there, Ben? Now? Yeah, apparently the, the, the mic yeah, in your yeah. headphones. Mic in your headphones over overrode yeah. and it didn't work. I can hear you. Now? So yep. All righty. So Ben, tell me about uh what's your reaction to what, what Kevin had to say and uh and uh and the idea of uh, that he's working on in his documentary. Uh well, we spoke about a lot. Um what do you want to talk about? Let's talk about the harnessing of the information. Let's talk about uh, data and sharing and, and the, the lack of uh, real polling and information where Trump's uh, guiding an entire election, um, how social media is being used very differently by both camps. Um, we see a, a dramatic shift, I think, in what I think obviously people keep saying that this is something new, this is a new election. But I think the shift in social media even caught the people who would consider themselves experienced with social media very much by surprise, uh, very much so. And I think it'd be interesting to see uh, what I would call a real-time documentary, sort of like you said, fly on the wall, uh, you know, just being there. Somebody has time. It's it's not wasn't wasn't something they were sweating funding for. It sounds like so they can focus on the content, the subjects. Uh, and that often produces, in pressure situations, very, very interesting documentary films, um, for sure. And uh, there are there are others out there, I would suggest too, um, Kevin, that are uh, very interesting films. And we could talk about it on a different time. But 
A lot of uh, people, for example, the Orange Chronicles, uh, following the Ukrainian Revolution, where they went through an entire process that happened in front of them in real time, and they were able to document that like no other outlet on the planet. Um, right. But these were just people shooting film. It wasn't something, they weren't reporters or journalists or something like that, but they were there and they had the access and they made that film. So, yeah, you know, the revolution in Serbia was similar, similarly documented as well. Yes. Yep. So, and I would say that most of these revolutions uh, in the last you know, Arab Spring, for example, all those revolutions were documented like that. It's, it's how it started. It's, it's, it's how we heard about it. So I think it's interesting to watch Trump sort of uh, even turn, turn it, turn that upside down. So, so um, speaking of uh, stories in the news, uh, as we always do, um, and given that this is a bit of a conversation you and I have had before, uh, one of the articles that you and I shared had to do with uh, uh, the American Anti-Defamation League's report about a small cohort of Trump fans are behind a lot of anti-Semitic Twitter abuse of journalists. So here we've been talking about journalists covering the campaign, but we're starting to see on Twitter that a handful of Jewish journalists who are publishing stuff that is not so flattering of Trump, and trust me, that's very easy to document without having to insert any opinion, uh, are getting trolled by very anti-Semitic attacks on social media. What do you think of this? Well, uh, you know, this is another deep question. I mean, what we're looking at here is um, really very significant uh, open playing field. Twitter's an open field. Um, there's really no rules and regulations, even though there are rules and regulations that uh, seem to govern it. Um, and that, you know, one of the ideas that I think, again, maybe on other social media sites, capability to, you know, speak amongst groups or with groups. Uh, Twitter is very, very much an individual platform in a lot of ways. Uh, and you are in a position to sort of not be in a position to defend yourself, if I may, right. if Twitter, Twitter trolls. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and the trolls can sort of f form roving packs of coyotes in a way. And, 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 and tag team off each other. Um, I know, as I mentioned a few episodes ago, uh, you know, one of my emails, a rather innocuous email, uh, to the DNC communications director was part of the hacked emails and got posted on WikiLeaks. And I started getting attacks by trolls on Twitter and uh, by email, and they even started calling me at work and, su and such. And because uh, I'm, you know, easy to find. Uh, but right. the tenor, you know, first they started attacking my professionalism, you know, and they were looping in um, uh, Trump's communications director quite explicitly, tagging him and saying, yeah, he's going to be able to rip you to pieces kind of thing. But eventually the attacks became anti-Semitic. You know, they started right. to attack me. They called me a kike which is a terrible word to call a, a Jewish person. I reported it to Twitter. Twitter's response was, that doesn't violate our terms of use, which right. so, is crazy right. so, because, you know, it's the equivalent well, of sure. other words for other people that does violate. Well, of course, and we can get sort of, that's again what I mean by the details too. But, you know, to me, really, just stepping back to your original question, I think the biggest issue here is the, the sort of enabling of this that, that's been going on. And this, this is true for the tenor of the entire um, race. And, and I believe that Clinton's campaign is guilty of this uh, in a lot of ways as well. Um, that being said, they're, they're repeating these phrases that Trump is saying, which in turn feeds his base, which in turn they feel is a way to defeat um, the base or maybe the independent voter to sort of create a situation where they won't turn over to uh, Trump's side, for example, to repeat these, these sayings and these things over and over and over again. So, you know, it's, it's hard if I were the other person, Trump or anybody, to do nothing but respond uh, to these type of situations and in turn try and turn the tide. So it's like so I feel that they're both really feeding off each other here at this point. So you're saying that in the process of calling Trump out on the – questionable things he says, the Clinton campaign is, in, a, in effect, egging them on 
him and his supporters on to say more. Absolutely. It's a no -win situation. But here's why it is, but I think this is why in the debate, uh, the, the camp Clinton campaign was clever enough to potentially pivot away um, as they sort of, you know, were able to sort of deflect questions from WikiLeaks and emails and sort of stay above that while Trump had the mutter under his breath to ruin the sound bites that I think Clinton was looking to get. So, you know, I do feel, and this is just my observation from the debate, that they did look to change it. Um, social media was ferocious in the dialogue, although Trump, I think, was up, was it two, three to one or whatever it was, but significantly up. Um, but a lot of that was a negative side. But I, I, I think it's possible that we watched Clinton's campaign look to sort of shift that. We saw a lot of policy. It was good moderation on the debate. So, yeah. So I think up until this point, though, we are seeing them sort of like eat, eat each other's arms <laughs> as, yeah. as uh, goes on. It strikes me that, you know, when you, t when you tweet these days, if you're on the Twitter website, you can pull down a menu of, of uh, um, animated GIFs. And uh, if you search yeah. for Trump wrong, you will find a GIF of Tr that in a loop of Trump just going wrong, 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 <laughs> wrong. Well, you notice Pence, Pence did the same thing. They had the same response. Um, so I, I think this was part of their strategy, believe it or not, you know, was to make sure that their comments, whether it contradicted themselves or not, were on that tape where, you know, so uh, Clinton couldn't get a little soliloquy, a little piece out there. But let yeah, me say I this like real the, quick. Yeah, oh, uh, disrupting the, the, uh, I, just wanna... I like the disrupting the, uh, the, the soundbite comment that you made. That's a very powerful observation. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think somebody in a, a reality TV show would know enough to think like that. But um, yeah, I, I think the other point was, too, was that watching Trump um, at this stage of the game, we're, we're, I think it's possible we are looking at an end game. But it's, it's a pivot moment. It's another pivot moment. I don't think this republic, uh, you know, the downfall, I'm not going to believe the elections, is, is an issue for you know, the people that were going to vote for him. I think, believe it or not, we might have seen more libertarian independents move towards him, you know, and I think we've watched uh, you know, him put like a, a flag uh, in the sand here, for sure. So I, I think this was a call out. I think it was a deliberate attempt to really solidify a base there and entrench himself so to see what happens, what would happen after the election happens. So mm -hmm. he's, he wants to be part of this game. He's not going to go away in a landslide for sure. He's not going to walk away from this election. Yeah, yeah, my opinion. Uh, most definitely. I'm going to uh, bring Ken up for a couple comments, and I'll, uh, we'll come back to you, Ben. Ken, how are you today? Doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing very well. Good to see you. Uh, so, I, I want to talk about another article that you sent me. But before we do, what do you what do you what do you make of the debate last night? Well. I don't disagree with uh, Ben's assessment that uh, you know he, he, he stuck the uh, flag in the ground and staked out his territory, but we're now at a point where he has to rapidly expand his reach, and he's right. really not doing that. What I was really impressed with with the debate last night was seeing Hillary go on off. She has a high degree of confidence. There was something that happened very interesting in this, on Spin Alley after the debate last night. And some of her surrogates outright were talking about her imminent victory and Trump's imminent defeat. Breathtaking to hear campaign surrogates talking like that essentially three weeks out. Yeah. However, we now know that she's moving in Arizona. We know the campaign is sending its best surrogates to Arizona. We know they're spending a million dollars on advertising in a relatively inexpensive media market to advertise in if you use the system that Kevin's using and talked about, which is very cheap, targeted cable advertising. You know? right, right. Um, by the way, speaking of that, uh, before I forget, I have to give Hillary credit. I loved watching her advertise in Bruins games um, during the primary season. I thought that was a brilliant buy going right at Trump's essential base, potentially. But what right. really blows me away is I'm now finding her buying ads on fantasy football sites. Really? For instance, oh, yeah. She had a beauty that aired during uh, Fantasy Football Now on uh, uh, 
uh, ESPN2 on Sunday. I thought that was a brilliant buy, you know? And I, I, so I just say that aside. Getting back to the point, they're about to spend money in Texas, okay? Texas yes. may very well turn out to be in play. Georgia is in play. So I Florida think that what we saw last, you know, right. But I think what we saw last night was a very confident Hillary Clinton demonstrating the fact that this thing can be put away. Um, I think one of the biggest events that occurred in the last 10 days was her writing a $7 million check to the Senate campaigns. A very wise investment. I think we've spoken about it here on this show that she really doesn't want to be elected president without having at least one chamber of commerce. Uh, excuse me, one chamber of Congress with her. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. She'll, yeah. Never, have the of She'll never have the chamber of commerce with her. Yeah. <laughs> but so I think that that's a. I think that's a really uh, a wise investment. That's for sure. Um, I want to dial back into uh, something that first Ben said, and then something that Kevin brought up real quickly before we move on sure. to our yeah, next, absolutely. Uh, trending topic. Um, I also find, uh, prior to the uh, talking under the breath, Ben, I found that he was doing a lot of coughing uh, during previous debates. Um, Sniffling he, began doing, he began doing it during the uh, 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 primary season, and I recall uh, uh, him doing it a couple of times uh, during the first debate with Hillary, and I took that, the, I read that the exact same way that Ben read it, which was a nice way to step on a soundbite. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, so, that, so there's that that's observation. That's fascinating. Yep. Now that's, the, um, go ahead. No, I mean, that's fascinating the way he's, he's really playing to disrupting the, the units of message that are typically reused in campaign commercials, in, you know, uh, and so she, you know, she's got all these great comments and, and she's saying these things and he's saying wrong. And, and you're right. My reaction was, well, but there's a, there's a tweet record. There's a videotape. There's an audio recording that says that she's right. But the reality is that she, her, her, her soundbite no longer exists. Right. Um, absolutely. Um, it's, um, it's, go ahead. Way to do it. The way to grab it is to grab the soundbite, the, the video clip with her saying it and him saying wrong, and then immediately flash up the documentation that show, shows he's full of crap. And no, I think very, that can, it's very usable. Can it on it very easily. Yeah. Now, here, but here's the thing I will say. Given the big picture, it's a very small ball strategy on his part. It isn't going to achieve very much when you're behind the way he's behind in key states. I mean... Virginia off the table two weeks ago, um, breathtaking, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. He's 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 pandering to his base, yeah. which will shore up their turnout, but it isn't enough to win. Right, right. Um, to a couple of things that Kevin brought up when he mentioned my name. Um, it can be fun, but was what was really fun was literally being on the bus. I had the privilege of doing five New Hampshire's, and. Right. Being on the bus um, was something that uh, not only gave you unprecedented access, but in between filing time, an awful lot of time for, um, uh, you know, uh, playful schoolboy fun and, um, uh, you know, uh, chicanery that didn't hurt anyone, if you know what I mean. Yeah, the, the Boys on the Bus book, I forget who wrote it back in 1972. Is that, what was it Krauss? Um, oh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on it, but it was it was sort of the 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 the, the counterpart to uh, the companion book to Hunter Thompson's Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail. Right. Um, I'm just I just wonder how you know how much of that still exists. You know, does the media does does the political reporter bus still have that kind of camaraderie or it has it just many buses out anymore. of people right the problem is there are not that many buses anymore i mean you you know there was a, there was an awful lot of unilateral travel and that sort of thing and by the way i also like traveling unilaterally and playing what we call zone for instance i had the difficult task of camping out uh in 2008 
uh, primaries in Las Vegas for two weeks ahead of that, um, uh, uh, ahead of those caucuses. Um, that is a good assignment to have as a reporter. <laughs> Let um, me ask you uh, to, to my question to Kevin about, you know, the, the, this idea of his, his talking about uh, reporters are assigned to follow the candidate mm -hmm. and as opposed to what I said of following the story. Um, in your experience, you know, when you were doing these, the, uh, uh, the, the primaries and the campaign work, you know, to what extent were you following the candidate and to what extent were you following stories? Because, because I worked for a major metropolitan paper and a major wire service, I had pool obligations. Okay? So I had body watch. That's what we call following the candidate. Okay? okay. Body watch. But really, it, in all of my experience, it's always been the two blind. You have the responsibility. As a matter of fact, it's a very grueling task when you have pool duty to have to chase a narrative while you're having to, the responsibility of following the candidate and writing a pool report for your colleagues. So right. I always right. found that as something that was, you know, meshed down the middle. Now, the one point that Kevin made that really stuck out, and this has always been a problem, but it's really become a problem in the age of the internet. Too many of our editors are writing the story back at the desk. Kevin's respect and his observations for what he saw in terms of the on-the-ground reporters is a very astute and very, very accurate uh, uh, observation. What you have now in the age of the internet are a bunch of editors Googling the hell out of the story, okay, and finding everything that they possibly can find. And you might work very hard on the ground to find an angle, to find something new, to find what we call a scooplet, right? Right. And all of a sudden, you get on the phone with New York, in my case, and you hear, yeah, we're not interested in that. We hear X, Y, or Z is doing this. We need you to chase that. And you then begin to realize that, wow, the whole point of having people on the ground and learning and observing and trying to be the eyes and ears of our readers or our listeners, uh, viewers, depending on you know which, which brand of media you're working for, takes a secondary place to what a desk jockey is going to tell you back at Mission Control. Very, very frustrating. No question well, that about is, it. That is really an amazing observation. I think Kevin wants to chime in, so I'm going to swap you out for him. So, Kevin, tell me what that clearly triggered something in you. Up, oh, I'm not hearing you, Kevin. There we go. There we go. So, uh, just a five-word addition. It's not the editors are going to, uh, you know, search Google. I mean, they're using a lot of analytical trending research to find out what is happening on the net, so that, you know, they almost in real time are giving people, the, the reporters on the ground. Uh, their marching orders of what kind of footage or what kind of question to ask. So, uh, you know, just to echo what Glenn, uh, uh, Ken said. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's less about the angle, the story, the insights of the professional reporter, and more about the science of, of clicks. Yeah, it's no, it's no longer about uh, um, news instinct. It's right. even the editors back in the day you know, that's why they were editors. They had news instincts to assign stories. Now they're and I think, using analytics. And I think this speaks to, uh, you know, your comments earlier about the media dropping the ball and sort of creating this problem for themselves. Absolutely. All right, I'm bringing Ken back up. I think he's got something else to add here. We're running out of time, so we're going to wrap it up soon. Hey, Ken. Not so much to add, um, you know, uh, in terms of trending topics, I just think that we have to hit, um, you know, Trump, Trump book report because it was just yes. too good. Yeah, yeah and, and then that was the last question I wanted to float by you is, uh, so one of the big uh, uh, tweets, uh, hashtags that erupted out of the, the uh, debate was Trump book report. Um, and it was a, um, a, prof a teacher uh, who... 
Oh, no, St. Louis Alderman Antonio French fired off a tweet that basically said, Trump's foreign policy answers sound like a book report from a teenager who hasn't read the book. Uh, quote, oh, the grapes, they had so much wrath. I love it. And so off of that, yeah. which didn't even have the hashtag, off of that came a whole flood of tweets about Trump book report. Um, let me quick, quick example. Uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, worst cabin in the inner city, terrible schools, nasty women, and bad hombres everywhere. Um, right. Bad hombres. By the way, bad hombres was a close second in the trending uh, yeah. uh, topic on Twitter last night. The one I love, there's a lord, and he's got rings. Lots of rings. <laughs> the best rings. And two of the best towers anyone has, has seen. I mean, it was... It was yeah, because rings. Trump really loves his towers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was... Uh, it, you know what? This this election, in so many ways, is uh, uh, very sad and and to some people actually stressful. I, I I have to say, last night I did tongue in cheek tweeting as well. I also because I'm an American, I also multitasked and made sure I watched the baseball game at the same time. I might uh, I might add, but it really was I'm surprised you're still watching with the Red Sox out. The uh, dude, the Cubs <laughs> are the Red Sox now. The Cubs I know, I know. Are the Red Sox I know, now. I know. But, but seriously, um, it was really kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, soothing to see so many people dealing with an event like that last night in a tongue-in-cheek way. It was, it was much appreciated, and in my opinion, much needed comic relief. Yeah, I think you're right, because... Um, you can get, I mean, I know a lot of people that have been observing these debates and observing this election, and they are getting anxious, they are getting frustrated, they are getting scared, they are getting depressed. It's not, it's not a happy, happy experience for them. Um, I have friends who, you know, their whole lives avoided politics because they didn't want to go through this. And now all of a sudden they're paying attention because it's so extreme for them that they don't want it to become real. And, you know, uh, when, 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 um, when we were talking to Kevin in the beginning about getting him on, that was one of the things that he discussed. Um, you know, I think it's probably going to be a forthcoming work on his part, but he has some pretty interesting conclusions about when this whole, uh, you know, uh, sort of digital dilemma began. And uh, you might want to pull him up for a couple of words. It's up to you, obviously, we're, we're late here, but... It's he has some interesting words to say and some interesting observations about this very subject. It it, about, it, it begins before well before this election. Well, I'm gonna grab Kevin right now and bring him up. So Kevin, um, Ken says that you have some specific ideas on when this started to happen. Well, uh, you know it's interesting. It, this, this election has been defined by, you know, the 40 years globalism, the march towards globalism, but no one's really talking about the, the same 40 year march of, you know, first satellite uh, with CNN and 24 seven in 1980. And, right. and, you know, as Alan, you and I discussed, you know, C-SPAN was used by Newt Gingrich. So this, this whole uh, partisanship and, and technology march has gone really hand in hand and intertwined. Um, you know, from the Fairness Doctrine going out in, in 87 to talk radio to, you know, Fox News going up in the 90s to, of course, where we are today. So um, I would leave you the closing, uh, actually, with the conversation you had earlier about, um, you know, uh, the trolls and, and, and the attacks you were getting and the anti-Semitism and, and et cetera. I mean, we've always been imperfect creatures humans you know we've always been uh, uh um, you know as nasty as we are but we've never had a platform that allows you know someone to reach out from massachusetts to somebody in in virginia and and you know show hatred to, towards that yeah and, yeah and you know ultimately you know this remember we didn't have cell phones really uh you know in in 2008 this is our first real election with with mobile communications what the hell is it going to look like in 2020, 2028, and how is that, you know, going to affect how we have uh, democracy or whether we have democracy? 
Yes. That yes. is the big question. Well, that's a good question. For me, I'm a little optimistic because by then most of the people will have grown up with it as opposed to people who've come to it. And, and I think that they'll have a better sense of how to leverage it for good. New norms, let's hope so. I, I hope so. Well, well, Kevin, I really want to thank you for, uh, for joining us. And of course, always uh, great to have Ken and Ben on the show. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing your movie when it comes out. And uh, so thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much. Great to see you. All right. And uh, so that's the, uh, we're going to wrap up the Dr. Digipol show for the week. Let me just tell you, uh, next week uh, we have, uh, we are expecting to have Charlie Mitchell uh, as our guest. Charlie has written a book called Hacked, which is about uh, cybersecurity in, in the United States. And of course, with the Russians hacking our election systems in Illinois and Arizona and one other state with um, Elect, uh, the evidence pointing to the Russians being behind the uh, the email hacks at the DNC and John Podesta's Gmail account uh, and uh, and the like. Um, clearly, this is an issue that has major impact and implications for our elections and the integrity of our democracy. And so we're very excited. Uh, Charlie Mitchell, some of you may remember, was uh, the editor in chief for many years of Roll Call. So he not only has uh, this expertise in cybersecurity, but he also has this deep, deep understanding of politics and uh, uh, in Washington and abroad. And uh, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what he has to say. Uh, so we're here every Thursday afternoon on um, on the Dr. Digipol show. And we hope that you'll be here every Thursday afternoon with us to interact with us. And of course, you can always go to our Facebook page at, at facebook.com slash Dr. Digipol is in. And that way you can watch our vote, our shows over and over and over again and share them with your friends and make sure that they watch them over and over again because we want to make sure that you guys have the insights that our guests can bring to you because it's important to understand what's going on in this new digital political age. And with that, we're out of here with our theme song and a little head bopping. <laughs>